Okay, great. All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day six of the National Arts and Health Week. Um, so if you've been tuned in this week, um, I'm sure you must have had an amazing time since we have had all sorts of amazing events and speakers and films and workshops, you know. And if you've ever thought about learning how to shoot with drones, then you've come to the right workshop because this afternoon we are really excited to be joined for a photography masterclass slash workshop with Mr. Johnny Miller. Um, I would like to invite you all to <laughs> hello, Mr. Johnny. Please wave at the audience. Hi. I would like hi. I would like to invite you all to remain open minded today and eager to learn. Um, be ready to ask all of your questions. And by the end of the session, we will take up a few and have Johnny provide us with the answers. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read Johnny's bio. Um, so Johnny Miller is a photographer and multimedia storyteller based in South Africa and the United States of America. He is interested in exploring social justice issues from the ground and from the air. His photographic project on equal scenes has garnered widespread praise and has been featured in many of the world's top publications. So he is currently a senior fellow at Code for Africa, a senior Atlantic fellow for social and economic equity at the London School of Economics and a BMW foundation responsible leader. Johnny is also the co-founder of African Drone, a Pan-African organization committed to using drones for good. He attended Dickinson College in Pennsylvania, USA, and the University of Cape Town in South Africa. So we are very excited to be joined by him this afternoon. Please join me in giving him a round of applause and then I'll let him lead us into the world of drone photography and storytelling. So good afternoon, Johnny, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Erica, that was a really nice introduction. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, uh, thank you, Kunle, for inviting me. Uh, Kunle is also an Atlantic fellow, and we know each other through that amazing fellowship, which I can't speak highly of enough. And this class, this presentation that I'm going to give is about my work using drones, which I find is a profoundly sort of transformative piece of technology and um, an, an extremely interesting piece of technology in, in regards to a lot of different ways of use. Um, so a little bit of history about me. I'm American originally, but I moved to South Africa in 2012. Um, I made a home there. So I have basically lived in Cape Town ever since. Uh, although during the pandemic, I unfortunately needed to leave uh, to go back home to spend time with my family, as many of us did. So I've got one foot in on the African continent, one foot uh, in the Americas. Um, I'm coming to you now from Argentina, actually. So I, I work in different countries doing drone photography and also journalism. Um, the story of how I started using drones um, is kind of an interesting one. And I think it, it might be best to show you the presentation that I have. It's got a little bit of a background on unequal scenes, which is my photo project that's popular, maybe you've seen some of the images. Um, and then I, I'm going to kind of segue into the different ways drones are used. So African Drone, which is the organization that I co-founded in uh, South Africa, although we're present in over 30 African countries, does do a lot of different kinds of uses of uh, use cases using drones. Um, but there's also different use cases that we don't do that might be interesting to you as well. So if that's okay, Erica, I'm going to start um, sharing my screen here. Okay, that's fine, Johnny, please go ahead. Do you need me to transfer that to you? I, can you see that? I can see that, just give me one second. Okay. So you can see the title screen there? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so this is Cape Town. Um, Cape Town's a beautiful city. 
I um, am familiar with the fact that a lot of Nigerians like to go to Cape Town to shoot music videos because I was in one. Um, and so there was a, uh, a music video that was on a yacht there in the, in the harbor that I was part of uh, way back in the day when I was not a uh, world trotting photographer, but more of a struggling student. And it's a beautiful city, but it's extremely unequal. And so when I went to University of Cape Town, I studied anthropology. And one of the things that came out of my classwork there was this idea that using data, you could see how unequal Cape Town was. And by that, I mean, hold on, let me show you the data here. Cape Town has extremely um, divided population. So during apartheid, black and colored people were forced to live in different parts of the city than white people. And so when you look at data, like when I looked at this photo or this map when I was in college there, it, may, it really stood out to me that there was ways to see the inequality that weren't just from a ground level, not just walking around the city. Um, and so I, I bought a drone and this was 2016 when drones were relatively new in America and I brought it back to Cape Town. And I went to a place in Cape Town and this is the map view of it. And the dots, by the way, are the purple dots are white people the green dots are black people and the yellow dots are colored people. And those are sort of South African racial categories and classifications that they use on their census. And you can see that the system of oppression and disenfranchisement that was put in place legally during apartheid is still in place today in an informal way. So the community there is called Masa Pumalele and it's a very low income area it's got extremely high levels of tuberculosis and HIV and um, unemployment, crime. And the surrounding area is kind of like wine farms. So really nice houses and wine. Um, the racial juxtaposition also is very, very shocking. Um, so I decided, why don't I take this drone? And I had the idea that maybe the drone could see something from the air that I couldn't see from the ground. Uh, but I didn't, I hadn't seen anything before. I hadn't really looked at Google Earth or anything. I just had an idea. And I went there and in South Africa, maybe similar in Nigeria, crime is a big deal. So there's a lot of high fences everywhere. So I parked in, this is a screenshot from Google, but I parked in this parking lot and the fences are high, like they're higher than my head. So I couldn't see beyond the fence, right? And I put the drone on the ground and the drone went up into the air. And this is the video that came out from it. So the um, informal part of the informal settlement, um, Masapu Malele, are those tin shacks there that are going into the wetlands. And on the other side is this gated community with uh, relatively wealthy, well, not relatively, extremely wealthy people, uh, most of whom were white, who live on this beautiful gated community near the beach. So I took a photo, this photo here, and I put it onto my Facebook page, and that was uh, May of 2016, May 8th, I think. And I went to sleep. And then when I woke up, it had gone viral. So my Facebook page, which had like 200 people that liked it, now had over 1,000 people uh, sharing, talking, liking my image, and not all of them saying positive things. So it was a a moment in time where I um, had inadvertently, let's say, created or put my finger on a topic that was people were really passionate about to the extent that I thought about closing my Facebook page and not continuing with the project. So for example, um, people saying, um, oh, that, you know, inequality is a biological trait or, you know, um, people are just lazy. And then other people saying that's complete, you know, untruth and, um, you know, that we need to work together as a rainbow nation and as a post-apartheid society to fulfill the ideals of Mandela. Um, it was just really pertinent, amazing conversations that were happening on my Facebook page. So I kind of swallowed my pride and decided to continue. And I traveled throughout South Africa, like I went to Johannesburg next. This is a photo from Johannesburg. Um, and the entire country of South Africa and maybe 
you're familiar with this because of the Time magazine article that came out, it's, it is the world's most unequal country by at least the World Bank's standards. So you can see, for example, there's a road or there's a river or there's some sort of barrier between very wealthy people um, and a slum, essentially. This is in Durban. This photo is very, very popular. This is a, a golf course named after a popular resistance hero during apartheid named Papua Sugalem, who there was an amazing story of him winning a golf championship and he beat the best white golfer in South Africa at the time, this is 1967. And when he won, he was gonna get his trophy outside and it started to rain. There was a thunderstorm that moved in and everyone ran into the clubhouse, but because it was a whites only clubhouse, he was left outside. So there's a famous photo of him in the 1960s receiving his trophy, a big gold trophy in the pouring rain because they wouldn't let him inside because he was colored. Um, and this golf course was then named after him uh, in 1994 when apartheid ended. And then of course the irony, the sad irony is that there's now an informal settlement or a slum that's sort of taken over part of the golf course. Um, this image, um, and I mean, South Africa is a very amazing place with a lot of different kinds of unequal scenes, but this image always stood out to me as kind of the defining image of what inequality looks like just because of the scale and um, the balance, I suppose, of that road that's slightly curved. And uh, Time Magazine actually put this as their cover image in May of 2019. Um, so that's that was sort of the capstone moment for this project for me. Um, I'm happy to talk later or if you have questions about the aesthetics or the practicalities of using drones in terms of image making and social activism. Um, there's a lot of things that I've learned along the way, a lot of things I can tell you, um, and especially about how images create change. Um, a lot of people, you know, and maybe you're even thinking this, I don't know, look to me and go, okay, you're a photographer, taking photos of inequality, but what are you actually doing to reduce inequality? What are you doing to change this, the system? Um, and I've, I have a lot of thoughts about that also in terms of, from the perspective of a journalist or a photographer, how can you contribute to making the world a better place? Um, I've been to many countries during this, doing this project. This is uh, in India. This is uh, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. This is Namibia, Swakopmund, uh, Nungui, the northern part of Zanzibar, uh, and San Francisco in America. Uh, the whole time kind of using my artistic license and the drone to speak about inequality. And, you know, inequality is a, I just had a big conversation yesterday at dinner about this. Inequality is a topic that everyone has their own ideas about. It kind of depends what you're interested in. If your personal interest lies in uh, identity politics, for example, like race, sexuality, um, personal choices, inequality is a real thing. If you're an economist, wealth inequality and income inequality is a real thing. If you're um, sort of a macro economist or a globalist, like post-colonial extractive financial setups between, for example, Nigeria and the IMF or uh, Botswana and the World Bank or the Chinese and Eritrea um, might be your version of inequality. And all those things are true. So the way that I've looked at things with the drone, because of the fact that it's got a relatively wide angle lens and it flies, has been to look at how cities are organized to speak about income and wealth inequality. And I paint with a pretty broad brush and people use the photos for a lot of different ways of talking about inequality. And I think that's part of the reason why drones are so incredible. They're, they're kind of like a Swiss army knife or a tool that many people can use for different uh, reasons. This is New York City. Um, this is a place this, that I just went in Lima, Peru. And that's called the wall of shame actually separating uh, rich from poor. 
it's not Photoshop. That's actually like the image. Um, the, the way that I frame the term drone journalism um, is basically using drones as the primary storytelling methodology in, in whatever story a drone journalist is doing. So for example, using drones as like a, a photo that doesn't add anything different than a photo from the ground wouldn't be considered drone journalism um, in my mind. And I was one of the first people to call myself a drone journalism, a drone journalist, excuse me, in on the African continent. Um, but I'm, I appreciate that that term also changes all the time and people use it for in many different ways, which is okay. Um, but I think that the best part about drone journalism is that it challenges, you know, the status quo with new technology. I see drones as really democratic. I see the ability to be able to fly above yourself and look at the earth from top down is something that has been ruled by rich people, powerful people and governments for since the beginning of flight, basically. So since the beginning of the hot air balloon, which was kind of like the first form of flight on earth, the ability to go up and look down has been something that's only been reserved for powerful people. And then in 2010, 2012, things changed and drones became affordable. So now you can buy a drone for maybe as cheap as 30 or $40, won't be a very good drone, but they do make them that are that cheap and, and look down on your house, look at your neighbor's house, maybe look at the president's house and see what's going on, right? Who's telling the truth? And I think that that's incredibly democratic, just as much of a revolution as, for example, smartphones or camera phones uh, were in terms of technology. Um, oh, there's audio. Let me stop that. So drone journalism, just like journalism in general, the point of it is to speak truth to power, right? And I think that using a drone in terms of speaking truth to power, the type of photography that you get with drones is, is very objective. And by that, I mean, photography normally, photojournalism throughout history has been taken at ground level with portraiture and landscapes with a human scale as main driving elements in terms of the narrative. Drones are different. Drones are much wider in scale. They take in a lot more in a single image. The image on the right here is a refugee camp, although they call it a relocation camp in Cape Town, which is seen as this bastion of uh, good living and wine and fun. But this, this sort of underbelly of Cape Town is the fact that there's millions of people who are living in really bad situations and in these kind of strange relocation camps. And the drone takes it all in. It gives you an ability to see things in an objective way, or at least I like to think of them as an objective way, in a way that from the ground, you might not feel in the same way, or you might not have the same response to. Um, so for example, the Cape Town drought, where we almost ran out of water, um, was a story that I think was best told with drones. And some of my images went viral there right at the beginning of that drought and kind of kicked off this flying over a dam with a drone phenomenon that took off during 2018 also. Um, using a drone to, for example, do investigative water projects. Um, like in Cape Town, they, they dump raw sewage directly off this beautiful beach. And actually it was a small pilot, a plane pilot who pointed this out, but using drones, I was able to provide some um, evidence for the investigators who were looking at this. <clears throat> And then my most recent project with Code for Africa was looking at hostels, which are a phenomenon of um, the South African landscape um, as a legacy of mining, where Black people were forced to live in hostels um, and, and only men were allowed, women weren't allowed. Uh, the idea was to create an environment much like a prison where people wouldn't be able to socialize with the outside community or escape. Um, and the reason why I think this is relevant is because about 100,000 people in South Africa still live in these hostels. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is in Johannesburg. This stuff, almost impossible to tell from the ground without a lot of context. The drone, you can get it like this. Uh, these are some of the 
images of hostels that I saw from the air. This is another photo of one in Langa. They're kind of strangely beautiful in a weird symmetric way. Um, I'll run through this. This is a story on American infrastructure. Um, you know, I, I don't want to take up too much of the time talking about my projects, but looking at things from above, using satellites, using historical maps, using drones, um, can give your readers or your viewers another insight into a particular topic that I think is really powerful. Uh, moving on to African drone and moving on to the other uses of drones. Um, African Drone launched in 2017 to use drones for good. Uh, these are my co-founders, Freddie uh, in Dar es Salaam and then Christian uh, in Nairobi. Um, we began by supporting drone journalists and drone journalism, but we've moved to other forms of supporting drone activity on the continent. For example, drone mapping. Um, Africa has a mapping problem. And by that, I mean, Africa is vastly under mapped. Uh, most Continents in the global north, including Europe and North America, have been mapped extensively with beginning with planes and then moving on to satellites and then moving on to drones um, since the beginning of the 20th century, pretty much. But Africa, there's large parts of Africa, especially in the DRC and, and Central Africa, that have not been mapped uh, at a high resolution. The reason why resolution matters is because you can start to tie an image to a place on the ground very accurately. So what we have been supporting is high resolution mapping using drones where people can say, that's my house and actually then win the title to their land or prove in some other way that they actually live there based on the GPS coordinates. Um, this isn't something unique. I mean, African drone is one player but there's many, many players doing this uh, including Freddie uh, with the World Bank. He works closely with the World Bank um, and some of the stuff that he does with fixed wing drones allows him to create these 3D models of Dar es Salaam. And the reason 3D models are, okay, they're fun. Everyone loves looking at 3D models, right? Because it's cool, it's like a video game. But what you can do with 3D models and what you can do with drones that's more than just looking cool is actually create a 3D map. So a 3D map will give you elevation data and elevation data in Dar es Salaam is important because the, the rivers there, like the Jingwani River here, floods every year. Actually, it floods twice a year. So the, the government can use drone data to see where the houses are that have been built informally that are in flood drainage areas and mark them orange. And there's a whole reason, there's a whole list of reasons why that's important, mainly because you don't want people to die when the rivers flood but insurance companies, uh, risk adjusters, the government, uh, emergency responders all use this data, property valuation people use this data um, to plan cities in a, in a better way than a completely informal system. And drones are used for this um, pretty extensively. These are fixed wing drones, just on a technical note. Um, they look like wings, like on an airplane, they're like a, a wing. Uh, versus the kind of drones that I normally fly, which are like helicopters. Uh, this is in Nairobi. I don't think I need to show you that, but uh, the story in Kibera, which is maybe you've heard of it, Nai Nairobi's largest slum. It's quite famous. Um, we used mapping to provide evidence that they were moving um, people in an unsustainable way in a potentially illegal way. Um, and because drones were relatively new at the time, um, this was something that was really that was really needed. We could actually create a map of where the road was bulldozed through the middle of Kibera. And then that can situate on Google Earth or some other form of a map that people can use as evidence. Uh, this is us training um, people to, to fly in Kibera and then also doing the flying there on a rooftop. I wanna, I, I put this slide in my slideshow because of the fact that this is focused on health, this healthcare uh, conference. Uh, people are using drones. African drone is not using drones to deliver medical equipment, but people are using drones to do that. Uh, Zipline is probably the most famous company and they are from California. 
they have Californian um, uh, people in, in charge, uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, but their first country of operation was Rwanda. And that was the very first operating drone delivery system in the whole world was in Rwanda, which is a very drone friendly country, um, which I thought, which I always think is interesting because people think of Africa as a place where people come to do R and D, not necessarily to have an operating um, business with revenue. Um, but the Rwandan government has been very proactive in um, in providing avenues for tech startups to operate there and providing them the runway to, to become sustainable. Um, so kudos to the Rwandan government for that. Rwanda is a very mountainous country and uh, people who were suffering and needed drugs or blood would have to wait for someone on a motorcycle to be dispatched from a hospital in Kigali. And so Zipline saw an opportunity where drones could dramatically reduce that time by flying and then dropping blood from a parachute. And when I was there, I was actually there and I've watched this happen. It was pretty incredible to see the parachute come out and people catch it with blood um, packaged, of course. So it's <laughs> not exploding all over them. That's not, what I, uh, that's not what I meant, but it comes out in a really nice way. The nurses run over, pick up the blood and run inside. And the whole process is managed with iPads in a very sophisticated way. Um, we've also supported the African Drone Forum, which was hosted in Kigali. Um, I'm going to run a little bit quickly. I don't want to show you this whole video, but the president of, of Rwanda was there. It was a massive gathering of uh, drone experts, mostly from Europe and the States in terms of the manufacturer of drones, and then drone users and government officials from Africa who were interested in using it to what, what African Drone Forum called leapfrog the infrastructure challenges on the continent. Um, by some estimates, Africa needs upwards of a trillion dollars of investment, US dollars of investment in infrastructure in the next 30 years. And that's probably not gonna happen. So people are looking for ways to circumvent or leapfrog existing infrastructure and do things in a different way. I think um, a lot of people are considering Africa to actually be well positioned in a strange way from not having the infrastructure burdens like North America does. And uh, that makes a lot of countries in Africa free to experiment with alternatives, for example, drone delivery or mobile payments um, or other ways of uh, using tech, using entrepreneurialism to, again, leapfrog the challenges. Um, African Drone Forum, uh, sorry, African Drone also brought um, 21 youth scholars from 11 different African countries. Um, these are amazing uh, young Africans who are using drones for good. Um, we did have a, a couple from Nigeria who came, uh, Nigerian Americans, and then uh, one guy from Lagos actually in the back with the yellow hat on. Um, and just incredible people who are interested in using drones for a variety of reasons. But the prerequisite for us was that they wanted to use them for good not just to make money or not to use them for like uh, an oil company surveying, but to, for some sort of social good. Um, on my website or on our website for African Drone, but also Unequal Scenes, um, I have created some documents. If you're interested, um, they're kind of mini master classes, if I could call that, on drone journalism story production and also multimedia journalism projects that walk you through from budgeting to production to post-production. Um, and we also have a drone database on the africandrone.org website because one thing that people always ask me is, what are the legalities of flying a drone? Like, there's always a few questions people ask, which I'm assuming you is already in the chat channel now, which is how much do they cost? That's, I always get asked that immediately. How much does this cost? How far do they fly? How high do they fly? How long do they stay in the air? And then finally, once all those are asked, is this legal? So we created this drone regulations database. So whatever country you're in, you can go to this database and at least get from the horse's mouth, which is the official CAA or Civil Aviation Authorities website, which we pull from, what are the regulations in Nigeria? And within that, there, were all, there will always be local conditions on the ground 
that may change or may be different, but this would be from a national level. And all drones in every country that I'm aware of are managed at the national level through the aviation authority, whether that's CAA in South Africa, CAA in Nigeria, or the FAA in America. So I'll end there. Those are my websites and my uh, email address. Um, I'm on Instagram as well at Johnny Miller Photography. Um, but I welcome any questions that you have. I know this is pretty heavy focused on journalism, um, but if you're interested in, for example, I don't know, uh, agricultural uses of drones, um, architectural uses of drones, uh, photogrammetry or creating 3D models, I'd be open to sort of giving you my experience with those things, although I don't know if it's sort of as vast as it is in terms of <laughs> my experience with journalism and photography. Um, or anything else that you would like to talk about. So thanks very much. This is wonderful, Johnny. Thank you for this um, amazing presentation. I had a few questions myself, which I posted in the chat. And I would appreciate it if you would just maybe try to see if you had a response for those um, before any other person. Sure. Did you see the first question? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, <clears throat> just so if, if people aren't looking at the chat, Erica wrote, um, what, are, what are some of the cultural, social, and ethical challenges of being a photojournalist? And I think that I would make a distinction between photojournalism and drone photojournalism um, because I have never really worked as a photojournalist. I've, I've, I've worked as a journalist in some capacity and I've worked as a photographer in certain capacities, but I've never been hired by a newsroom and I've never contributed on a story, I don't think, to a newsroom directly. Um, but a drone photojournalist, um, which is slightly different, I, I would say the interesting thing there are the ethical challenges. And this is something that everyone has an opinion on. And I, I don't think there's a right answer and I don't think there's a wrong answer and getting a dialogue going so that everyone feels comfortable and um, appraised of what's going on in terms of a production is really important. And by that, I mean, Drones fly over the tops of people. That's literally what they do. And different countries and different cultures have different ideas of what that means. In South Africa, there, there are regulations against flying over private property, for example. Private property above your house is considered yours in South Africa. Uh, it's a little tricky when you talk about helicopters and manned aircraft because they do fly over private property. But generally speaking, you can't fly a drone over private property because of the fact that you're infringing on someone's privacy. In America, as an alternative, there's no such thing as privacy in your, above your house. There may be such thing as privacy in terms of what you reasonably expect to be private. So if you have really tall walls and you're in your backyard in a bathing suit and a drone comes and takes a photo of you and you use it in a slanderous way, that is something that's that's pretty commonly or well known as an infringement on privacy. But flying there, not an infringement on your privacy. It's the act of taking a photo and using that photo that could be problematic. So what I mean by that is the ethics vary from country to country and culture to culture. And generally what I say to photojournalists, drone photojournalists is, are you considering the safety aspects of what you're doing in a an honest and realistic way. Do you have the experience to actually know how to answer that question? And once those are yes and yes, because they should always be yes and yes before you're getting anywhere close to people, then is what you're doing worth it? And I use that sort of broadly because sometimes as a photojournalist, you do have to do things that make people feel uncomfortable in order to bring some sort of truth or to speak some sort of truth to power. I think probably the most common one that everyone's uh, familiar with is war photography. Actually seeing how the sausage is made, and by that I mean actually knowing how photojournalists go into a war zone like in Ukraine 
and take photos of people who are suffering is not nice, but that's our job. If you feel like photojournalism has a value in society, and I believe that it does, you have to accept that there are things that are gonna transpire that are not gonna be nice. People are going to have to see blood. People are gonna be crying in front of your camera. Um, people are going to disagree sometimes with where you're standing or what you're doing. And you're gonna, and as a photojournalist and as a drone photojournalist, it's similar. You have to be very well aware of what uh, conversations are happening in terms of ethics, what precedent has been set both legally and sort of in the public civil discourse around your work. And then just from a moral barometer, like what are you comfortable doing? How can you sleep at night? Are you gonna be able to do you know, this job for a long time or are you gonna break down because you're, you're breaking the rules or you're hurting people somehow? So to me, the idea that a drone that flies high enough to have no one individually be um, identifiable is an acceptable way of bending the rules in order to speak truth to power. And that's the that's that's a decision that I've made a long time ago in order to do my work. That I think many people, when I frame it the way that I just framed it, would agree with. Um, but I'm open to that discussion because there is an element of extractivism in drone photography. For example, you don't get the consent of every single person that's in your photograph, even if they are very small. That is, um, that is certainly a, a live conversation in terms of ethics. Um, so hopefully that answers partially your question, Erica, um, that first one. And then the second one- Both of them actually. <laughs> ah, okay. yeah, informed consent. Yes. Well, I, I mean, any research, any research uh, that you undertake ethically, if it's cleared by a university, needs to include some sort of guidance in terms of the methodology, right? So I'm not 100% sure what you mean by research subjects, but in terms of journalism, there are certain standards that mass, that mainstream journalism outlets will have. And there, if you're working for a university, are accepted methodologies and ethic, ethical guidelines that universities will have. If you're a citizen journalist or you're an influencer or you are an interested person and you're interested in looking at a topic, let's just say pollution in Lagos, right? It's a tricky one. I think in general, again, that people should be acting first in a safe manner, but then secondly, in an ethical manner and ethically meaning is this not just okay to me, but would this be okay if I explained it to a reasonable person looking from the outside in? And that reasonable person doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily the person you're taking a photo of. It would be a reasonable person in sort of an, a, an anonymous citizen group, kind of like a jury. That's kind of how I look at it. So for example, if you're looking at a community like Makoko, which we've worked in, making sure that there are people who are in charge in Makoko, the chiefs, the, the people in charge of how that community runs, who understand what you're doing and understand that even if you don't get informed consent from every single person that you fly over, there are people in charge who know what you're doing and they agree with it and that you yourself are flying safely, then I think that that's, that, 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 that's acceptable. In fact, that's, I mean, the only way to do drone journalism. It would be completely too time consuming and expensive to try to knock on everyone's door and ask them, I'm gonna fly a drone over your head in 25 hours, you know, and I have to talk to 30,000 people in Makoko. It's totally impractical. So that's a, that's a difference and it's a live conversation in terms of ethics in drone photojournalism because it's different than portraiture. It's different than interviewing someone and seeing their face. Um, and, and uh, you know, another thing that I think is interesting is not just photos, but for example, uh, models, you know, like there's a lot of things that drones can do. They can create 3D models of a space by flying over it and using photogrammetry. Um, you know, how are you using these images? Are you using models in a way that's more than just voyeurism, if it's um, something that's actually constructive or brings some sort of awareness to, um, a community? Or are you just doing it as sort of like a voyeur 
and using a, a cool model or a cool technology um, to, to get likes or clicks. But these are things that, I mean, as an American, and I'm coming at this having ra been raised in America for 30 years before I moved to South Africa. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say that is because the American philosophy on things is imbued in my work. And by that, I mean, allowing individuals to make a decision instead of relying on regulations in order to prevent you from even getting to the point of making a decision is generally something that I support. And drones are a really good example of that. Allowing drone pilots the freedom to be able to move and to use that technology in a way that may be beyond what the scope of the actual regulations are because it's very restrictive in a country like Nigeria or South Africa, I, I, I think opens you up to a lot of corruption. Hmm. And so uh, in South Africa, for example, it's about 3000 US dollars to get a drone license. That's crazy. You, I mean, that's more expensive that. than any other country I know of on earth. And South Africa has a very low GDP compared to Germany, America, or Australia, where it all costs a very small amount of money, right? So a lot of people in South Africa that I know of are flying illegally. And then of course they open themselves up to corruption because if they get caught, the police are gonna say you're flying illegally. And the regulations say this, and you're only doing this, therefore how are we gonna make this work, right? And I know people who have paid bribes and I know that it happens and I'm sure it happens in Nigeria too. And I think it's a problem. And I think as a, a drone journalist, we should be free to use drones just like any other technology with accepted ethical guidelines, yes, but not with undue and onerous restrictions on how they fly or how much money we have to spend in order to tell a story. Because using drones can be a different way to tell a story. It can speak a different kind of truth to power. So that's why I think it's more than just a fanciful sort of whim that journalists want to use to get likes. If you're using it correctly, it actually could change people's minds in a really powerful way. And do you think that so this maybe, is a conversation that could be brought up to the government or is this something that's just kind of kept within the photographer's network? No, I mean, African drone has, I mean, I've spoken on this topic before, African drone in part was created in order to provide uh, a, a, a central point of resources in terms of drone regulations and potentially lobbying to change laws, but just really to make people understand how restrictive they are. A lot of people in South Africa didn't realize how difficult it was to fly a drone in South Africa until African drone started saying, it's only $100 in America and an online test. You don't have to fly your drone in front of anyone. And people aren't flying drones into aircraft at the airport mm -hmm. in New York. Like there's never been a manned aircraft that's been hit and brought down by a drone, which I think is kind of amazing to be honest because there's a lot of stupid people in the world. But that's the number one reason why these regulations in South Africa were written like that. But it's just not true. So um, 100% there's a, a place for lobbying governments. Um, I'm not I'm not 100% aware of where the Nigerian government stands on drone regulations, but the last I checked, it was pretty, pretty restrictive in order to be able to fly there 100% legally. Just uh, on another note, this next question here, saying, have you been at risk? I just want to answer that question before we finish. The risk element of flying is unfortunately higher than if you're not flying a drone. And I was talking about this the other day here in Buenos Aires, that there's an element that's unpredictable and knowing how to mitigate that unpredictability to a minimal level so that it's very unusual that you would have an issue or an accident is basically the number one goal of any drone pilot or it should be to fly as safely as possible because you're putting people at risk underneath of you. You're putting property at risk. Um, so no, I mean, making sure that you are confident in flight, making sure that you're confident knowing how to work the software, knowing that you know what the weather's doing, what aircraft are nearby, what it looks like on the ground, if there's people that are, you know, would hurt them if it fell down or if they're covered by like a roof, all these things are, it's a whole lot of factors that go into it. 
Um, there's also an element if you're flying around informal areas of personal safety, which is why if it's possible, I always work with a fixer or with the second person because you have to concentrate and you're concentrating on a screen and you're tunnel visioned onto the screen. And if you're flying inside a informal settlement or something like that, there's a lot of people who um, might wanna take advantage of your inattention, let's say. Um, luckily, I've never really had a problem. And I wouldn't say that I've ever been at risk beyond what I consider acceptable amounts of risk is. And I'm a pretty conservative person, I think. So I, I, don't, I don't push the boundaries. It's the, the, the downside is too much of a downside for me to want to push the boundaries, right? Hurting someone by flying carelessly or losing my drone is too much of a downside. And you can always fly in a safer spot because drones go a long distance. You can always move back and fly on top of a roof further away or in a field further away. Um, so that's what I'd say there. I do have some fun stories, but I'll probably save those for offline conversations. <laughs> but I've never been at risk. That's great, thank you. Um, I think I have one last question before we wrap up here. So for anyone who's looking to start, you know, sort of drone photography, for, for example, like what are some skills you'd say they need to be successful in this, in this area? What are some social skills? Because I think we've kind of covered the technical aspect of things. I think it suits people who um, potentially like don't want to get and do the dirty work, get into the, the weeds and do the dirty work of investigative journalism or portraiture, kind of typically photojournalism type things. That's a hard job. Photojournalism is hard. You have to build trust with people and they have to believe you in what you're doing. Flying a drone doesn't involve trust with people. It involves trust with yourself and it involves ethics, but it doesn't involve speaking one-on-one -on -one and having people uh, accept you into their homes and photographing them in a, a an amazing moment, but you need trust to be able to witness. So I think it's it's actually a pretty good profession for people who are uh, find that difficult, but still want to contribute somehow to a narrative. So in terms of social skills, I would say like drone pilots <laughs> in general are, are pretty solitary people. They're individualists. A lot of them are entrepreneurs. Okay. A lot of them use drones for um, a, a side income. There's a lot of different tiny ways that you can make money using drones. For example, I don't know, real estate or, uh, you know, music videos or, you know, there's a tons of ways that people want an aerial camera in the air and are willing to pay for it. So I think being entrepreneurial is a good social skill. I think potentially being someone who doesn't want to put in, uh, you know, the effort to be a photojournalist, um, it would appeal to them. I think people who are interested in tech, you ha that has to be a prerequisite because it's, there's no analog drones. It's not like you can shoot film with a drone. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to know how to use a controller. You have to be familiar with like video games. I would say people that have a good spatial awareness. If you're, if you're someone who can go into a city and your phone battery dies and you still know how to get home, <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good attribute to have if you're a drone pilot. If you remember what street you came down and where you need to turn left to go to your house, that's a really good skill to have as a drone pilot because knowing how the drone is operating in the sky without looking at your phone. For example, if you push left, is the drone gonna mm -hmm. go left or is it rotated around and it's gonna go right? So being able to manipulate things in a 3D space inside your head, which not everyone has, is also another good, I would say, ability to be a good drone pilot. But then also I, I would say like a rational, sober person. Okay. Um, That's important. It's not, a, it's not, I mean, if you're a thrill seeker, maybe drones aren't for you, you know, they're, <laughs> they can hurt people. They fly around, you know? Yeah, so, I, I mean, you know. <laughs> be, be a calm person that would be, you know, accurately sort of assess your calmness mm -hmm. level. This person also writes, how can I be a part of African Drone? Um, we do have a sign up page on our website. So um, either send me an email or go to our website and write. Um, just 
put in some basic information, which is what country you're in and your contact information. Um, and we actually do have some interesting things coming up. Pan the pandemic put a lot of things on hold, um, but in 2023, for example, we're gearing up for some really cool stuff. Awesome. And so I would love to have more G more Nigerians because, or from any country in Africa, but Nigeria is projected to reach a billion people. Is that right? Or is it 500 million? I can't remember. It's some incredible number of people by 2050. And you're going to have to use drones to get around, either for delivery or for navigation or for mapping. You're going to have to use drones. It's just too many people to use conventional infrastructure and technology, right? And so I think that there's like these incredible, inspiring use cases that are going to come out of West Africa and East Africa, for that matter, in the next few years that um, I'm really excited to see because... Um, Africa is kind of leading the way, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. People are doing more interesting things with drones in places like Ghana, Nigeria, and Rwanda than in America that I've seen. They might be American companies. They might be using American money. But the way that it's actually being operated is in Africa. And more and more, we're seeing Africans actually take the lead and start their own companies and fundraise themselves, which I think is awesome. Because once you start having Africans in charge, you start you you have different priorities right you have different philosophies for how you're going to run your business but then also the, the the sort of priorities that you want your business to focus on so i think it's really exciting i think so too so again johnny thank you again for being here and the work you do is so important um and i hope everyone has gotten some information and some useful um important notes from this um, of course, you can always reach out to Johnny on social media and on his website if you have any further questions. And, you know, of course, um, there are a lot of resources available for anyone who's also looking to get into drone photography. So I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to.